several years. And still it tells lies about one of them. Uh, I was born in 1933. I was born in cerebral palsy. When I was four and a half, Dad took me down to the local public high school, public parent school, to enroll me. And the principal said, we don't take people like that. We don't take people like your son. The law says we don't have to. When I grew up, there was no law requiring the education of people with disabilities. I got lucky my dad was a professor in Rutgers. He got me into a private school on the cheap, and I got an education. I was luckier than a lot of people who were born like me. In 1933, it was still legal to take people who were born with developmental disabilities and put them in institutions. And this is where your land is coming. coming. And sterilize because we wanted to purify the race. And we didn't want people like me to have such children that might be inferior. So hundreds and thousands of young people who were born with this world in this country were put away and were sterilized when they were put away. We were a whole lot luckier than people like me who were born in Germany because in Germany, the Nazis took everybody born with a disability, 400,000 people, conducted Kubo experiments on their bodies, and then thought, in fact, if you go to the Holocaust Museum in Washington, you'll see a letter from Hitler instructing his minions to, to round up every person born with a disability and sending them, send them to what they called killing house. I went to Germany in 1975 and there was nobody alive. I was born when I was, who looked like me. They had all been murdered. We, some of the parallels are, some of the experiences are quite different though. People who were African American usually lived in the same community. And so they, had a place to get together and organize if they were up to organize. People with disabilities lived all over the place, one at a time. I didn't know anybody with a disability until I went uh, to school in high school. Uh, actually, I only knew one African American until I went to high school. That was in Boy Scout here, where I met a guy named Steve Negron. And Steve and I became good friends because we were both different than anybody else. <coughs> now, my younger brother turned out to be an incredible athlete. And I decided and this may sound silly and arrogant, but I decided at the age of 11 that I was going to become a leader. Imagine that. A kid with a disability at a time when they were we were discriminated against. This is a decision. 
that he was the only, not only people with disabilities, but people in general. And so I studied how people live. And I became the president of my student council at high school. And I got the most votes for student council in college. And for some reason, I've been leading ever since. Now, a lot of it is dumb luck. And there were, there were pitfalls along the way. I got a degree, a master's degree in vocational rehabilitation after I went to college. <coughs> I went down to Trenton to see my old vocational rehabilitation counselor. He was now on his way to become coming director of that division. And I said, Mr. Sinclair, I've got my, my nice, shiny new master's degree in your field. How do I get a job here? He said, we don't hire people like you. Oh, oh. We don't hire people. A year and a half later, I was hired at a chronic disease hospital in New York. Ironically, well, I lived four blocks from Long Island City. <laughs> so we, our trails <laughs> crossed and recrossed over and over again. Uh, I, I didn't like being a vocational rehabilitation counselor because every time I called an agency to refer somebody else, they asked me whose client I was. They thought I was the client, not the person I was working with. So in 1964, I went to work, well, in 1963, let me back up, way back. As I said, I knew one black person when I was going uh, to scout camp. I went to work in this hospital in New York City. And pretty soon, I, within a year, I was the director of my unit. And all of the people who worked for me were African American. And I knew nothing about the African American community. The entire world at that, those days was segregated. <laughs> and so I began listening <coughs> to what the people who worked for me had to say, and I found something interesting. They were much more accepting of me than my white professional colleagues because they understood that people with disabilities were discriminated against, just like they were. And so there was an unspoken bond between us. And as a result, I wanted to learn more. And so I got in my car in August of 19, uh, 1963 and went down to the March on Washington. And I was there when uh, Dr. King made his speech. And I was so moved that I quit my job and went to work for the poverty program on the Lower East Side. And uh, I worked there until I did what I was told and got fired. <laughs> the, uh, the theory behind mobilization for youth where I worked was that we needed to teach people to organize themselves to change the world. And I was asked to teach a group to develop a curriculum for social studies. And my boss said, I don't care what you do just so long as you teach these kids the importance of organizing. 
I don't care they why she did the executive director would be teaching the audience. I walked into class one day and they were, the students were arguing about the existence of God. And I had a theory. My theory was that people who have power do things. And people who don't have power argue and spiral off into argue, argue. And so when the teacher told me that she had to tell the kids that they couldn't, they wouldn't get paid if they didn't work on Good Friday. I said two things. I said, that doesn't sound good. If I don't work on Good Friday, I'll still get paid. You're in a work-study program. So you're working for the same agency I am. Is there anything you can do about it? That's all I said. This is the magic of organizing. That's all I said. And the kids took over. There must have been eight of them in the class. By the time there was a break, they had figured out a plan to go to all of the other classes and organize a march on the executive director to demand that they get paid for good fight. And they marched, and they got paid, and I got fired. <laughs> and after, after a year and a half of not being hired and threatening to sue several organizations that refused to hire me because I had a disability, I was finally hired down in the Department of Community Affairs. <coughs> And my job was to assist organizations like SCAP, where Ron had his origins, to, to help poor people organize. And that's how I got to know Ron, and when he wanted to shuffle Katie off, I got to hire her. And I also got to know Yolanda because I hung out in Scaff all the time because I liked their whiskey. <laughs> I didn't discuss my call Scaff. <laughs> and uh, in the process of working with Ron, with Kate, and with Ted, I learned even more about community organizing and how it Change is only possible when people get together and work together on a common goal. So as I went through my career at the state, I eventually became the executive director of the Developmental Disabilities Council. Now that is the most marvelous job anyone can ever have because you're given three million bucks to raise hell. <laughs> three million bucks to raise hell. Now the law is incredibly different than any other law. It says you can take your money and use it to influence the opinion of decision makers, including legislators and the governor and mayor. Well, nobody took the law seriously except me. I mean, this is a national law. And I read it, I said, my God, look what I can do. And so, with the help of two people in this room, Carol and Luke, we organized a group called the Monday Morning Project. It was named at the Monday Morning Project because that was the first morning that we met. We had 
And this was the organization entirely of people with disabilities. And we had a, we had an outfit in almost every town with a chapter. We had a total membership of 2,000 people. Now one of the beautiful things about people with disabilities, when you're talking about organizing, is that most of us come with equipment, like this baby. And when you come with equipment, you look twice as big as the ordinary. <laughs> <laughs> or three times as big, or four times as big. So you get a bunch of people together in wheelchairs and scooters and walkers, and it looks like you can take over the world. <laughs> so we did. We, we were first organized when uh, Newt Gingrich took over Congress and was threatening to, to cancel all of the laws that, were, that protected the rights of people with disabilities. And so we organized to stop that. Then we decided we ought to do something at the state level. And Somebody came up with the idea of having an, a statewide disability political convention. Not a conference, but a political convention. And so we set about organizing a political convention. What's the first thing you got in a political convention? You've got a platform. You figure out what you want the politicians to do for them. So we went through a three-month program where people got together and worked out a platform that we could offer to each of the people running for government. And then we invited them to come to the convention. Now the first time, the only person we invited was, was uh, Governor Chris. Uh, oh, what was her last name? Come on, help me, guys. Governor Christie with me, Kate. Now there's an interesting little trick involved here. Governors never write their own speeches. The guy who was supposed to write the governor's speech didn't know anything about this book. So he called a friend of mine who wrote speeches for the head of the Department of, of Human Services, who happened to be my best friend. So he and I sat in my basement at my computer and wrote Governor Whitman's speech <laughs> for the convention. And Governor Whitman said, whenever an issue that affects you is discussed in government, you will have a seat at the table. <laughs> and boy, that sounded familiar. <laughs> but that was the one of our, one couple who belonged to the middle St. County chapter got very upset because when they went shopping after a snowstorm, there was snow piled up in the handicap park. I don't call it handicap parking. I call, call it parking reserved for people with disabilities, but that takes too long. So we drafted a bill requiring that the snow be removed from the handicap parking within 24 hours. Called it the snow removal bill. At the convention, we had a snow pile to advertise the bill. 
tell and Luke did all the work I just sat there and, and made the speeches. Uh, the bill got passed. That's why there's a fine of two hundred and fifty dollars if you don't remove the snow. A public parking space is there for people with disabilities within twenty four hours. The next time, the next convention we had, Justin Dodge, who was the founder, was the father of the American Disabilities Act, came to speak. There's a reason he came to speak. When, when the bill was up for, for passage in the Senate, well, let me tell you about the House first. The bill came up in the House and after that, and nobody wanted to pass it. And the American Disabilities Act gives us our civil rights. It is a major piece of civil rights legislation in the disability world. Nobody wanted to pass that bill until People from an organization called ADAPT got to the foot of the Capitol. You, you guys have all seen pictures of the Capitol and it's got that big flight of chairs, stairs leading up to the top. They left their, their scooters and their wheelchairs and their crutches and their walkers at the bottom. And crawled all the way up the stairs to demonstrate. And they were caught on TV. And because of that, the House of Representatives passed the Americans with Disabilities Act. But the Senate, the Senate didn't. And I got a call one afternoon from Justin Dudd who I said was the father of the Americans with Disabilities Act. He was the one in Washington who was coordinating the passage of the bill. And he said even neither senator from New Jersey is supporting the bill. Can you do something about it? And I and a woman that Luke and Carol knew well, who is probably one of our greatest heroes, a woman named Colleen Frazier. She died in the, in the Pennsylvania crash on 9-11. That was the crash where they kept the plane from going into the White House. Colleen and I got, got a hold of an accessible bus and a driver. Monmouth County and took 11 people down and visited with Frank Lautenberg and with Bill Bradley. And by the time we got home, both of them had signed on to the bill and supported. But we weren't done. You know how, mu how much credit we give George Bush the first for signing the ADA. He didn't do it because he wanted to. He was refusing to sign the bill until 200 of us, Dad and I was there, gathered at the Capitol building and marched over to the White House in the rain and held a candlelight vigil singing freedom songs and that's one, one of the other things that is so common that so often the songs that we sang were songs that were part of the black civil rights movement. We marched over in front of the White House and woke Barbara up and she 
he evidently got upset and made George come out and talk to us. And he, saw, he agreed to sign the bill. There are <coughs> I told you uh, there's one more story I want to tell you about. I told you how when I was growing up people were put in institutions. When I worked at the public advocate we were defending a young man who was severely mentally retarded and was in an institution called North Christian Development. It was the first time I had ever gone to a development. And I have to tell you what I saw. I drove into this place. It was, they called the place cottages. They held 60 people. They were on this wonderful campus. A lot of green grass. But when I got there, there was no green grass. It was snow five days before. And there wasn't a single footprint in the snow. Because nobody was let out. And I walked into this cottage where C.S., which was the name of our client, was held. There was a big room, about twice or three times this size, with nothing in it but a TV set, on a TV screen way up on the seat, and two staff members sitting in school desk chairs. And there were 60 men milling around in every stage of it, undress. You can the place smelled like my granddad's pigsty because they couldn't go to the bathroom except for themselves. There were people lying in the corner covered with sheets whose muscles had contracted so badly they couldn't open their hands or stretch their legs. They were so contorted that all the staff could do was to throw sheets over them. When I became director of they announced the closure of the first development, and I got the council to become the first organization to support that program. As a result, the unions who didn't want to lose their jobs there, and the pan vilified me in the newspaper. They called me names. They said I couldn't have a developmental disability because I could drive a car. They attacked me personally. They attacked the division director for making the decision to close the place, but not on personal grounds. When we had our second convention, the parents and the union members threw up a picket in front of the door. And they chanted, Ellis must go. Ellis must go. I had recently been married, and my wife also had a disability. was helping my mother, who was in her 90s, come to the convention. And she had mother had to walk through this picket line of people chanting, Ellis must go, Ellis must go. We closed that place and two more. And when I tried to close the other one, it made the governor mad. I, I was still there long after she was gone. <coughs> if you want, 
you like. You have to fight through. You have to be willing to take chances. But you have to find other people who are willing to take those chances with you. Because they can pick you off one at a time. But they can't pick you off in big groups. Now Ron and I didn't tell some of our wild stories. <laughs> when Ron was director of SCAP, he made the people in the state so unhappy because they couldn't figure out his, his financial wheelings and dealings, all of which was legal. <laughs> they sicked the FBI on it. <laughs> and Ron, tell them what happened in the morning when you tried to make a phone call. Yeah, I was, uh, the FBI had tapped into my phone line at my, at my house. And uh, they didn't. Do, <laughs> they didn't try to make it a secret of it because I pick up my phone in the morning to make a telephone call, and I could hear them in the background talking and whatnot. I couldn't get a line, right? So I screamed, at them, "Will you cut it out and hang up the damn phone so I can't use my phone?" <laughs> and they wouldn't hang up. <laughs> so <laughs> one night I'm trying to call Ron, and I didn't mention this, but at one point in this story, I was a drunk, and I had a little too much to drink that night, so I was trying to come over on, and I couldn't get through. I kept dialing and dialing and dialing, and I kept getting a busy signal. And he told me about the FBI on his mind, so I looked up the FBI in the phone book and called him up and told him to get the hell off the line so I could reach my buddy. So you don't have to be that dumb to organize folks. But you have to be willing to take care. Let me close this way. When there was when it was the 15th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act, Kate Luke came to me and said, the Monday morning folks don't want to celebrate the anniversary because they don't think our civil rights bill is working. They want to bury it. They want to have a bike to threaten with the ADA in a symbolic cost and have a ceremony. Yeah. And I began to do some research. And I found that people with disabilities were worse off. In 1905, in 2005, than they were when the Americans with disabilities they were worse, worse off economically. They lived in worse houses. They had worse education. They had less employment. They were sicker and died quicker. I began to wonder about this and I read some more. And I looked at what happened to African Americans after the the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was passed. And on average, now remember this is on average, on average, they were worked off in every way than they were when the Civil Rights Act was passed. And I decided to do a little more research than I looked at Title IX. It was the first attempt to giving women civil rights. And I discovered by studying economics, every, in every way, the average woman <coughs> was worse off than when Title IX was And I realized that we weren't dealing with a black problem or a disability problem or a woman's problem. We were dealing with a political, economic 
cover. That our taxes had been shifted so that we were paying the bill and the rich folks we were getting richer and poor people were getting poorer. And that, that was a self-conscious intentional move on the part of the people who governed us. <coughs> This may not be fun to hear, but we have the best money, the best government money can buy, and we can't even rent it for hell. That means that until we change the economic and political system of this country, People with disabilities are not going to make gains. Women are not going to make gains. African Americans are not going to make gains. Now, some of us may escape. I'm an escapee. Ron's an escapee. Kate's an escapee. <laughs> but that's all due to individual luck and circumstances, not to the fact that we. But average. What the challenge that lies before this community and every other community that is excluded from power, from the right to be included, the challenge that lies before all of us is to unite together. Black, brown, male, female, young, old, as, as that great champion of liberty said, educated and not educated, we all have to get together and insist that we change <laughs> this country and regain the democracy. Ron and I were born in some years ago. Thank you.